Hello friends, welcome back. In today's session, we will continue our discussion on the basic aspects of spectroscopy and talk about the nature and characteristics of spectrum. Uh, the session is planned as follows, that is to begin with, we will briefly recall or review what we did in the previous sessions, thereafter we will move on to the types of spectrum. This we will discuss in the context of atomic systems and then we move on to the molecular systems. Having done that, we will talk about the origin of line spectrum and the band spectrum. We will try to compare the two. Thereafter, we will move on to the characteristics of a spectrum. We will try to see what kind of spectra are there and how do we characterize them. And in this context, we will talk about the position, the intensity and the width of a spectrum. We will try to define what they are and then we will talk about the factors which make them arise there. And then towards the end, we will try to sum up what we do in today's session. Okay. Now, let us move further and start by recalling what we have done so far. What we have done so far is, we started by introducing the concept of spectroscopy and defined it to be the study of interaction of radiation and matter. Having done that, we moved on to talking about the nature and characteristics of the EM radiation. And then we moved on to discussing the nature of the matter that is atoms and molecules because our spectroscopy is study of interaction of radiation and matter. Then we talked about the nature of radiation, moved on to the nature of matter and then we continued our discussion and moved on to the interaction between the two. We talked about different possibilities of interaction and the prerequisites for that kind of interaction to take place. That is where we are so far. Now what happens is when the radiation and matter the two interact that results into a spectrum and that is what you are going to focus our attention today on to. Okay. Now, let us see what is a spectrum, how does it arise and what kind of spectra do we come across for different kind of systems, say atomic systems and molecular systems. To begin with, let us try to see one thing first. Now, if I have any light source or any radiation source for that matter, typically all radiation sources are polychromatic. That means, they give out radiation which are spread over a whole range of frequencies of wavelengths as they are. Now, look at this picture here. I am just showing a simple source of radiation there. Now, in this case, when the radiation comes that is polychromatic, when that is made to pass through some kind of a dispersing medium there. So, in this case, I am using a prism as a dispersing device. So, what happens is when this radiation passes through the prism, it gets dispersed into wide variety of colors in this case. Otherwise, basically, this the polychromatic radiation gets dispersed out because of the difference in the refractive index there. And if you look closely, what you find is that this typical our rainbow or the Vibgeor, you see that there is a continuous variation of the wavelengths or the frequencies over there. This is a typical example of a continuous spectrum. That means, kind of radiation sources, they give out radiation which are polychromatic and they give a continuous spectrum. Okay. Now, let us move further and see that when I take such a source of radiation there and make the radiation pass through some medium which is an absorbing medium there. I am talking about atomic systems to begin with. Now, suppose I have got a atomic system which can absorb radiation. Then thereafter, this is my incident radiation there which is falling on the system. Something comes out of it that is a transmitted radiation there. When I take this transmitted radiation, pass through the prism again and see what do I get here. What do I get is that I get the same radiation as we had before, but there are a few places where we find that there are these are lines over there, these are the radiations or these wavelengths are missing in the spectrum there. That means, they have been absorbed there. Essentially, what it amounts to saying is that in this kind of an absorption of radiation by atomic systems gives us a spectrum which consists of certain number of lines over there. That is about the absorption spectrum. If we talk about a different situation now, now suppose I have an atomic system which is in the excited state there say sodium or any uh, vapors, these are heated vapors over there. Now, if you take that and since we know that we have learnt earlier that anything which is excited 
will try to relax down and come down to the ground state and that can be kind of accompanied with some kind of a emission of a radiation that is called as a radiative relaxation. Okay. Now, suppose I have a system which is an excited state there that is emitting a radiation, that radiation which is emitted by the system, I make it pass through the prism again. What do I observe? What do I observe is that I get certain radiations over there. These lines are indicating of uh, the frequencies or the wavelengths which are emitted by the, uh, the system over there. So, this is a typical example of an emission spectrum. Now, let, let us take an example. Let us take an example of say sodium. What you see is I am showing you two spectra here, both of sodium here. The first one here is an emission spectrum. What you see is there are two distinct yellow lines over there. They come at 589 nanometer and 589.6 nanometer. That means, if I have got sodium vapors at high temperature, when they relax down, they give out these two radiation. This is typically what you observe in uh, sodium vapor lamps third, because that, that yellow coloration what I get from sodium vapor lamp is because of these two radiation which are coming there. That is the emission spectrum. On the other hand, if I talk about the atomic absorption, absorption by sodium metal, what you find is the sodium ions or sodium atoms there, you find that the, these two lines will be absorbed there. And the rest will come there, only these two lines will be absorbed by the system. Uh, what we conclude from this uh, diagram here is that is typically the atomic spectra are line spectra, whether they are absorption spectrum or the emission spectra, they happen to be line spectrum. That means, there are distinct lines coming there or distinct lines which are missing from the continuous range of the wavelengths or the frequencies emitted by the source over there. Okay. Let us move further and talk about the molecular systems there. In case of molecular system, I will I talk about, I give you some kind of glimpse of variety of spectra what we come across. Let us start with a typical UV spectrum here. This is for a gas phase system, this is for a system in solution there. What you find is that as against what we observed in case of atomic systems, there were distinct lines over there. Now, what we are getting is we are getting broad bands over there and this also is a, there are two big bands over there. What you find is that the spectrum case of a gas phase system is different from that in the solution. This we will talk about in the next session when we try to talk about UV spectroscopy. But what is important is that the spectrum looks like this. Okay. Let us move further. Let us look at this spectrum there, IR spectrum because UV spectrum typically is a electronic spectroscopy, electronic spectrum there. IR spectrum is a vibration spectrum and the spectrum looks something like this. And what we have is on the y axis we got something called as transmittance there and then we get different bands over there. And on the x axis we got a wavelength and we or by wave number we can use any of the two notations there. What is important is that here again I am getting some kind of bands there that is again an absorption spectrum there. Let us move further. Take yet another example. This is fluorescence spectrum. On the y axis I have got a fluorescence intensity as a parameter there. On x axis I have got wavelength there. And if you see it closely here again, I find that the spectrum is again a broad band over there. So, this is an emission spectrum because we learnt about that in the previous session that is fluorescence spectrum is an emission spectrum there. Let us take one more example. Look at this spectrum. This spectrum is a typical example of a Raman spectrum. In case of Raman spectrum, we find that there is a very intense signal coming here that is called as a Rayleigh scattering. And these smaller signals over there on the wavelengths or the frequencies higher than the Rayleigh scattering, uh, Rayleigh line or below that, they are the Stokes and anti-Stokes lines. We will talk in detail about when we talk about Raman spectrum there. But what is important is that this is the kind of spectrum which comes across as a consequence of scattering. You remember that when we talked about the types of interaction possible between matter and radiation, we said there could be an absorption, there could be emission or there could be scattering. So, we have taken examples of all the three kinds that is where there is an absorption there, we get a band spectrum. When there is emission, there again we get a band spectrum. When it is scattering, yet again we are getting the spectrum which is a band spectrum there. Let us move further, take some more examples here. Look at this. These are NMR and ESR spectra. This is typical NMR spectrum there. I am showing a very simplified version of that. Here again, we find that the spectrum is a band kind of spectrum there. And this is the ESR spectrum, electron spin resonance spectroscopy. Herein, I get a spectrum which is broad like this. Typically, this is taken as a derivative spectrum. We will talk more about it at a later stage. 
But the point why I want to bring home here is that in contrast to what we had in case of atomic systems, they were line spectra. On the other hand, molecular spectra are band spectra. That's a basic distinction between the kind of spectrum I get in case of atomic systems and in case of molecular systems there. Okay. Now, let's see what is the origin of these two kinds of spectra here. Look at this here. Now, what you see is that we remember that when we talked about the atomic systems, the nature, the quantum mechanical nature of atoms and molecules, we mentioned that in case of atoms, the electronic energies are quantized. That means typically, in case of atomic uh, energy level diagram, we we'll look something like this. We got energy level 1, 2, 3 and so on and so forth. And in case of absorption spectrum, what basically happens is our system goes from a given level to maybe this level or to this level or to this level. That means there are only distinct energies which can be absorbed there because energy absorption is where is it? The delta E values in the transition shown over here. So, suppose this is level 1, this is level 2, this is level 3. So, the energy this is E3, this energy is E1, E3 minus E1, if I give that much energy that will be absorbed. So, that will show up as a line over here. So, if I go from E1 to E4, so that will be the delta E value will be absorbed. So, that line will be missing in this case. That is the point here is in case of atomic systems, only discrete energies are absorbed which show up as lines over there. Similarly, in case of atomic emissions as well, the system to begin with is in higher energy level there. It can come down to maybe this level or to this level here or to this level. So, all these delta E values which will be emitted as radiation will show up as lines over there. So, that is why we get line spectra in case of atomic systems. On the other hand, if you remember, when we talked about the quantum mechanical nature of molecular sy uh, systems, we said that in case of molecules, the electronic energies are quantized, so are the rotational and vibration energies. And the energy level diagram is very complicated. I am showing a simplified version here. So, say I am talking about one absorption here, say electronic absorption from a level 1 to level 2. So, these bold lines are my electronic energy levels there. But we remember that all electronic energy levels have accompanied with them, there are vibration energy levels over there. And within vibration energy levels, there are rotation energy levels there. So, when the electronic excitation takes place, say in case of molecular absorption, what happens? We go from a given level here to you can land up somewhere here or here or here. So, all these delta E values will be absorbed, say from here to here, this, this, this. That means, there will be absorption of very closely spaced uh, wavelengths over there. And similarly, we can have transitions from say level V1 here to all these different levels over there. So, since there are large number of transitions which are possible and they are in very, very close vicinity of each other, so they form a band there. Typically, molecular absorption spectra are band spectrum. Similarly, we can rationalize the band spectrum in case of molecular emissions as well. Because uh, say in case of an emission, the emission starts from a, a given excited state and the molecule can relax down to any of the possible available vibration states of the ground state, uh, uh, electronic state over there. So, since lot of radiations can come out, so they also will come out as a continuous band over there. So, where are we? We have seen that uh, the nature of spectrum in case of atomic systems and molecular systems are distinctly different. In case of atomic systems, I am getting line spectra. In case of molecular systems, I am getting band spectrum. And we have also seen the uh, rationale or the reason for the difference in their nature of spectra there. Okay. Let us move further and talk about the characteristics of the spectrum. And herein, we will focus attention primarily on the molecular spectra because in case of atomic spectra, it is very, very straightforward. We get distinct lines over there, whether they are absorption spectra or emission spectra. But when you talk about the band spectra or the molecular spectra, we have to talk about certain characteristics there. We will talk about that in terms of what are these, what are the factors which determine them. Let us start with that. Now, let us look at the typical characteristics of a spectrum. Typically, a spectrum has got the following characteristics. It has got intensity. That means, what is how intense is the signal there? How intense is the band? Second is the position that is talks about the where is the band located, located on the x axis. On x axis basically we typically have wavelength, wave number or frequency there. And this is some measure of extent of absorption. We will talk about that in short while from now. And the third characteristic happens to be 
the width, how broad is the signal here. Okay. Let us talk about each one of them one by one in great detail over here. To begin with, let me just uh, put things in perspective. These three characteristics there, the first one, position basically is a measure of difference in the energies of the levels involved in the transition there. I will elaborate on that. Intensity is a measure of extent of absorption or emission or scattering, to what extent the radiation is absorbed, because this tells me which radiation is absorbed. This tells me about how much of it is absorbed or emitted or whatever. And the third one is which is called as a width, it is actually is a measure of instrumental and some intrinsic molecular parameters, we will elaborate on that. Okay. Let us talk about these characteristics one by one now. Position. Position as I just mentioned before is determined by the difference in the energies of the initial and the final levels there. So, we have a typical band over there and this red dot here is indicative of the position. When we talk about the position, we do not talk about the starting of the band or middle of this or here or here, we talk, which typically the position refers to the maximum here. It means whatever the signal is coming, the maximum of that is typically characterized as the position of that. Now, let us understand what does it mean. Let us look at this picture here. This is a typical molecular volatile energy level diagram for an organic molecule. And, and if you look at it from your basic understanding of molecular nature or the molecular orbital theory, we know that in case of a molecule, there, there are different kinds of molecular orbitals there and they happen to be sigma, pi, n, pi star and sigma star and that is a typical uh, kind of order of energies for them. Now, from this let me take a simple example there. Let me talk about two possible transitions, say a transition A which is from n to pi star, that means the initially the system is in the n level there, it goes to a pi star level there or we have a transition from say pi to pi star. The spectrum will look something like this. Now, what you find? What you find is that is this lambda A, lambda A happens to be the wavelength at which this maxima is positioned there, it is somewhere here and lambda B is the peak position of this particular signal over there. Okay. Now, what you find is that this A transition which is between n to pi star, this is the delta E value for this. Delta E value is less, the signal is coming at a higher value. You remember that we know that E is equal to h nu or h c by lambda. So, there is a inverse proportionality between the wavelength and energy. So, since energy happens to delta E value for this transition A happens to be less the signal comes at a higher wavelength there. That is what do you mean by the position there. That means, if I get a spectrum where different bands are coming, so they are indicative of uh, the delta E values of the energy levels involved in the transition for them. So, that is the meaning of position of a signal. Okay, Let us move further and talk about the intensity. Intensity is a very important parameter for us because this is typically used for quantification as well most of a very, very important application of intensity happens to be in quantification. We will come to that at a later stage. But for right now, there are three important factors which determine the intensity of the signal. Intensity as I mentioned before is, is a measure of the extent of absorption, emission or scattering and the factors which determine these are the following. One is the transition probability, second happens to be the population of the states uh, involved in the transition and the third one is the path length of the sample. Let us understand each one of them. First, the transition probability. Transition probability basically is a measure of the allowedness of a given transition. Now, what is this? Okay, Let us take this picture here. Now, I am showing here three energy levels there, level 1 with energy E1, level 2 with energy E2, level 3 with energy E3. Now, let me try to think of two possible transitions there, one from E1 to E3 and second from E1 to E2. I call it as transition 1, I call it as transition 2. Now, if everything else remains the same and if you observe that, that I1, I1 is the intensity of transition 1 happens to be more than I2, that is the intensity of transition number 2, then we say mu1 is greater than mu2. That means mu1 basically is an expression for our transition probability. That means, this transition is more probable 
than this one. That means it is allowed to a more extent than this transition. This transition probability basically is a quantum mechanical parameter. To work out, I will not getting into details of that because we need to understand what is the uh, wave function for the initial state, what is the wave function for the final state and variety of things involved in that. But for right now, for us it suffices to understand that whether a given transition is allowed or not allowed and allowed to what extent. And as it is a probability, the transition probability typically varies from 0 to 1. 0 means the transition is not allowed, 1 means it is allowed. And if you try to actually compute uh, the transition probability for different transitions in systems there, we find that the values will be either close to 0 or close to 1. And it is not exactly 1 or it is not exactly 0, it may be 0 0.1, 0 0.2 or maybe 0 0.8, 0 0.9. So, this 0 0.8, 0 0.9 are the allowed transitions, the one close to 0 are the so called forbidden or not allowed transitions kind of a thing. Okay. So, what is important here for us is that it is a measure of the alloutness of a given transition, whether transition is allowed or not. Okay. Let us move further and talk about the second factor which determines the intensity there. For this again, I take up three different energy levels there, say level 1 energy E1, level 2 energy E2, level 3 energy E3. And you remember from your basic understanding that according to Boltzmann distribution that is P2 by P1 that is a, the population of level 2 to population level 1 is given by the following exp Boltzmann expression which is a very, very familiar expression for you I am sure. And according to this what you find is that this level E1 is more populated than level E2 because this, this is, a, is a negative exponent over there. Okay. That means the population of level E2 is less than that of E1. Fine. Now, now let us talk about two possible transitions, one from say level E1 to E3, I call it as transition 1, second from level E2 to E3 again. So, this is my transition 1, this is my transition 2. Now, now if it so happens that if I assume that the transition probability for these two transitions, transition 1 and 2 happen to be same, I am assuming that. If in it be so, then what we will observe is that is the intensity of this transition will be larger than that of the transition number 2 for the reasons because in this case since the population is more that means uh, in a distribution that suppose I got 1 million molecules there out of 1 million molecules maybe about 30,000 are in say level E1 or maybe one, one, uh, about 0.3 million are in E1 say 0.27 million are in E2. So, E1 has got more uh, population of molecules there. So, when the photons come or the radiation come, the probability of them getting excited is more. That is why the intensity will be more of this for this transition than this one provided the two have got same transition probability. That means, that we assume that both are allowed to equal extent there. So, population matters in that sense. Any, uh, any level which has got a higher population the transition originating from that will have higher intensity that that that's the crux of it okay let's move further and talk about the third parameter here what is called as a path length now suppose i take my sample in this qubit or the sample holder over there and a radiation passes through that this is my incident radiation this is what comes out of it but if i take the same thing in a larger container there now when the radiation passes through this, what comes out the transmitted radiation will be of lesser intensity over there. So, that means essentially what happens is you have a radiation coming there, this is a material which is going to absorb. So, this is my uh, sample holder there, radiation is coming. When it goes through this, it meets number of molecules when it passes through that and those molecules absorb radiation and this comes out of it. But suppose as against that, if I got a wider uh, cubit, a sample there, radiation comes in there. So, when it passes through this, it meets many more molecules, the probability it is getting absorbed is more. So, when it comes out, it has got lesser intensity there. So, that is for larger value of B, B typically is a, the thickness of the medium there, which is absorbing medium there. So, if B happens to be more, the intensity of radiation which is coming out will be less. We will elaborate on that in the next session when we talk about UV spectroscopy. Okay. Let us move further and talk about the next uh, characteristic that happens to be the width of spectral lines there. Now, 
width basically as I mentioned before too, it is defined as a narrow range of frequencies absorbed, emitted or scattered because when we talked about the molecular spectrum, we said that there are very closely packed radiations are getting absorbed. So, that range refers to the width here, it could be frequencies or wavelengths or whatever the expression we use for that. Now, but typically this is a very uh, symmetric kind of a spectrum I shown there, but you remember that the kind of spectra I showed you they were not like this. So, how do we define what is the width of a spectral line? Generally, we express it as F w h m that is full width at half maximum. That is if this is the intensity of this, I take the half of it at this half the intensity half maxima what is the width of the spectrum that is given as a that is called as a width of the spectral line there. And for this there are two types of factors which determine this, one happens to be the extrinsic factors, the other happens to be intrinsic factors, let us understand these two factors there. The extrinsic factors essentially are related to the instrument being used there and typically what happens? Typically what happens is we have a source of radiation there, radiation is coming there, we pass through some kind of a slit which actually drops off most of radiation, allows some radiation to pass through and that radiation comes onto the system which is getting absorbed there. Now, typically when we used different kind of slits, we find that it is not only one particular radiation which is going through, a range goes through that and this is one picture which will be illustrative by itself. Now, this is spectrum for a given system obtained by using a slit width of about 16 nanometers. That means, and as against that, this is when the slit width happens to be 1 nanometer. So, what you find is when we have got a wider slit width, more radiation passes through. So, you get a broader spectrum there. As against that, if I use a very narrow slit width, we get a better spectrum there. We will elaborate on that when we talk about uh, the spectra and how do you define them later on. Now, what is important here is that this can be taken care of, but only to certain extent. That means, we can go on reducing the slit width, but we cannot go beyond a point. So, this extrinsic factor can be taken care of because once we go for uh, reducing this factor there, uh, the sophistication increases, the cost becomes more and so on and so forth. So, we have to optimize between uh, the kind of spectra I get, the nature of spectrum I get and also the cost of instrument I am going to use for that. So, we use it as per the requirements there. The next factor that is the intrinsic factor, this is very, very crucial. Now, these intrinsic as the name suggests, these are the ones which relate to the nature of system being studied, right? what, is the molecule, what is the nature of the molecule I am talking about. Now, and here again there are three things which are important there, the three factors and they happen to be what is called as a collisional broadening because essentially when you talk about a width, width basically is a broadness of the signal there. So, what is the origin of that? What are intrinsic reasons for that? They happen to be one is called as a collisional broadening. That means, the broadening of the line because of collision between molecules. I will elaborate on that. And second happens to be Doppler broadening. That means, broadening because of Doppler effect coming into play. The third one happens to be Heisenberg or lifetime broadening. I will elaborate on each one of them. Okay. Let us understand the first one first. That is, what is this collision broadening? This typically is observed when the sample happens to be in liquid or in the gaseous system there, the gaseous state there. And what you find is that you have molecule there. Suppose this is static molecule and in this molecule there are certain energy levels there. Say this is the one I am referring to here. So, you have got these molecules there which are moving around because molecules are not stationary, they are always in random motion at very high velocities. Now, suppose I have one isolated molecule there and this is the initial energy level there and this is the final energy level there. So, this delta E is the energy which will be absorbed and that will be represented in the spectrum, it will come as a distinct line maybe. Okay. But what happens is since the molecules are not in isolation, they are moving up randomly and also getting colliding with each other. When they collide, what happens is uh, because of collision between the molecules, the energy levels of the periphery because that means uh, the electronic distribution around the nucleus. If you look at the molecule here, there are two nuclei, there are certain electron distribution there. So, electron distribution of the outermost energy levels, the valence electrons so to say, they get disturbed. So, as a consequence, uh, 
the initial level there from where the transition is originating, which is somewhere inside uh, towards closer to the nucleus, that does not get altered there. But this valence electrons or valence shell, valence energy levels, so they get altered there. As a consequence, we find that this gets diffused to certain extent. I mean, there are different because suppose there are two molecules which are colliding. When they collide, so suppose this is impacting the other one, so this molecule's electron distribution gets dented. So, energy levels will change. Other one will comes, strikes with slightly different energy, will get dented to a different extent and so on and so forth. So, as a consequence, we find that in different molecules, the energies of the levels with to which the transition is going gets altered to a variable extent. So, essentially it amounts to saying that we generate very closely spaced energy levels there uh, in a large sample over there. Now, when the transition takes place, it will take from, from here to all these possibilities there. So, as a consequence, uh, in the absence of collision, suppose the delta E value happens to be equivalent of say energy of 100 units there. So, I expect a signal at 100. But now, because of the collisions, so this level, this remains where it is. This becomes somewhere here, here, here or here. And as a consequence, the energy is equivalent of say 98, 99, 100, 101, 102, 105, they all will be absorbed. So, I get a broad spectrum there. So, this is what is called as a collisional broadening, broadening as a consequence of collision between the molecules there. Okay. The next factor, this is very interesting here, this is called a Doppler's broadening. I am sure that you know about the Doppler's effect uh, in sound because we know that when you are stretched, uh, on a radio platform there, a train coming to you or going away from you, uh, we listen to the two sirens very differently there because of the relative motion of the trains with respect to you there. Similarly, here again what happens is you have a molecular system there, you have a, a sample system, radiation is coming there and these molecules are not stationary, they are moving at vast velocities there. So, as a consequence what happens is, suppose a radiation is say photon is coming of energy say equal to 100 units again and this molecule is moving away from this at a very high velocity. As a consequence, the frequency or the energy of this perceived by this molecule will be different from what it is actually. And on the other hand, if you have this photon coming there, but the molecule is approaching this photon a very high velocity, it will perceive this frequency to be different there. So, essentially Doppler effect we can uh, express in terms of the following expression there, that is the absorption and emission frequencies show Doppler shift there. That means, a molecule uh, say is a stationary molecule, if it emits radiation of a certain frequency, it will absorb as the same. But suppose it is moving at high velocity and uh, gives out a photon, so the photon the effective frequency what you observe for that photon happens to be different there. So, this change in frequencies is referred to as Doppler effect there. Now, what you observe is that the frequencies shift in both the directions, that means uh, it will be more or less. So, as a consequence, as against one particular frequency to be observed, we observe that there can be absorption or emission of frequencies slightly more or slightly less than that. As a consequence, our signal becomes broad there. So, that is the second reason for second intrinsic factor which causes the broadening of the signal there. Okay. Now, let us take up the third factor which causes the broadening of the signal there and this factor is called as Heisenberg or lifetime broadening there. This actually arises because of the uncertainties in the energies of the excited state there. I am sure that you are familiar with one version of Heisenberg uncertainty principle that is delta p cross into delta x to be approximately equal to h cross. There is another equivalent expression for that, that is called as uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The uncertainty that is delta E into delta tau, delta tau is the lifetime of that or delta T, the time you can take to be equal to uh, approximately equal to h cross now, or equal to about 10 to minus 34 joule. Now, if you look at this, we find that uh, any system you take, suppose you got ground energy level there, there is an excited state there. If a system is in ground state, it can stay there for all times there, nothing will happen to that. That means the energy that the system is very stable there. On the other hand, when I give energy to this and the system gets excited to higher energy level, the system, the molecule does not stay there for very long, it has to come down. So, there is a certain amount of uh, lifetime which it spends over there. 
that is called as delta tau or delta t. So, as a consequence, uh, the excited state becomes uncertain, that means the energy of excited state becomes uncertain to the extent that is equal to h cross by delta tau. Okay. Now, what does it mean is that if you look at uh, the energy level expression there, so the ground state I can show with a distinct uh, kind of a uh, energy over there, whereas the excited state becomes diffused over there. That means, uh, the energy of excited state is uncertain to this extent there. As a consequence, when emission or absorption takes place, we find, so let me talk about the emission here. If this uncertainty was not there, the transition would have been from somewhere here to here. But now, because of the uncertainty here, we find that transition can start from here, here, here or anywhere of these things and what we get is, we will be getting a wide range of uh, the energies which will be absorbed or emitted as the case may be. So, such a, a width or the broadening is referred to as natural line width. We cannot do anything about it because it is very, very intrinsic to the system there. Okay. So, with this uh, we complete our discussion on uh, the characteristics of the spectrum and the reasons for their, them to be there. Let us sum up what you have done today. What you have done today is we briefly reviewed the contents of the previous sessions and thereafter we came down to uh, a discussion on different types of spectra, we get an atomic and molecular systems there. In case of atomic spectrum, we found that we get line spectra, whereas in case of molecular systems, we got broad spectra. And we then we discussed about why of these two, we explained the difference between the line spectrum and the band spectrum there. Then we talked about what are different characteristics of a molecular spectrum there. That means, this the spectrum which you come across in the molecular systems that there are three characteristics of that, the position, the intensity and the width. And then we explained all these characteristics in terms of the factors which determine them over there. In the next session, uh, with this uh, we complete our discussion on the basic aspects of this because that is all what we needed to know to continue further into understanding different spectroscopic methods there. In the next session, we will talk about UV visible spectroscopy. We will talk in terms of what is the origin of the UV visible spectrum and what are the characteristics of the spectrum, how do they look like and why of all that will be taken up in the next session. Thank you.